copyrighted program created for the Rio Grande Oil Company. Southern Police calling all cars, attention all cars. Special attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff's cars. Broadcast 99. Regarding two men wanted for robbery and murder. The driving a Chrysler Roadster. Last seen in the vicinity of Topanga Canyon. Heading north on Roosevelt Highway. These men are armed, so watch your step. That's all. Rolls and quits. <laughs> Grande has thousands of free gifts ready for distribution to every boy and girl listening tonight. If you want a police pistol, a sergeant's badge, a police girl's identification ring, a fingerprint outfit, or some one of the many other free gifts, you need merely ask your Rio Grande crack gasoline dealer. He'll show you how to get the complete junior police outfit free. For every adult listening tonight, Rio Grande has free gifts but of a different kind. When you fill up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline, you get extra speed, extra power, extra energy to meet emergencies, extra fast starting, and all these extras are free because you pay no more for Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl than for uncracked gasoline which lack these extra features. Because of the patented cracking process used exclusively by Rio Grande, Every drop of cracked gasoline is broken up into tiny atoms which burn evenly to give lightning-like acceleration. In other gasolines refined by cheaper processes, there is bound to be considerable weight from unburned fuel. Every drop of cracked gasoline turns into power. Nothing is wasted. That's why it actually costs you less per mile to enjoy police car performance in your own car. You get more for your money when you buy Rio Grande Crack. The gasoline that powers more police cars and emergency equipment than any other brand. It is now our great pleasure to present Captain Arthur Jewell, Under Sheriff of Los Angeles County. Captain Jewel. Good evening. There are a lot of misconceptions regarding law enforcement officers. The public seems to persist in giving the lawbreakers the break, at least as far as sympathy goes. This sentiment point of, sentimental point of view is wasted, for the modern law enforcement officers treat the suspect with as much, such, much consideration as you treat the man with whom you are conducting business. The day is a third degree of pie. The officers are in a business. Our business is to get facts. We are trained to get these facts, and we do not have to break any head to do so. A guilty conscience is our greatest assistance. We know how to question suspects so adroitly that sooner or later they confess their own volition. The record of Captain Bright's homicide squad of 98% solved cases during the 15 years of squad's existence to prove the efficacy of this system. Once we have amassed our facts regarding a case, we turn them over to the district attorney. From that point, our responsibility ends, accepting our appearance as witnesses. It's up to the court to pass judgment. We work just as hard to prove innocence as we do to prove guilty. A miscarriage of justice is a serious thing. So, bit of a scrammer. You have the police officer's job, and the story you're about to hear, you will learn how effectively Captain Bright and his homicide squad accomplished that job. morning in 1929. A cold, brilliant moon casts deep shadows in the depths of Topanga Canyon, throws a clear white light on the small twisting highway leading to Malibu Beach and the Pacific Ocean. Four men, out for a day's duck hunting, and anxious to reach their destination before dawn, 
feed between the towering canyon walls. Yeah, I hope I have better luck than I had last week. Boy, I just couldn't hit a duck if it had been tied the end of a gun. If there's any truth in the stories they tell about this spot we're headed for, there'll be plenty of ducks for all of us. Well, I hope so. I'm getting tired of traveling all night to a duck blind and missing them all and ending up in a restaurant for my duck dinner. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. slow it down a minute, Ben. Let's see what this sign says. Yeah. Oxnard, 41 miles. Uh, that's the place, isn't it, Jack? Yeah, just as right, Oxnard. We ought to make it just about right. Hey, what's the matter with that crazy fool coming towards us? Huh? Oh, look, he's turning right in the middle of the highway. I have all the fool rings to do. Now, look, he's stopped right in the middle of the road. Something's wrong with him, Ben. He's getting out of the car. Oh, he's stopped my wife. He's stopped my wife. Hey, come on. I hope for the love of heaven somebody help me. All right, all right, old man. Take it easy. We'll help you. Where's your wife? Uh, in the car. They shot her. They shot me, too. I uh, tried to stop them, but they shot her and then me. Terrible, Jack. Get him in the back of our car, and I'll take a look at his wife. Hey, come on with me. Uh, we'll take you to Santa Monica to the hospital. They'll fix you up all right. Come on. It's Lucille. They shot her. One of their names was Wood. Don't forget that name, Wood. Okay, we won't do Where you hit? On my shoulder, but it's all right. His name was Wood. You won't forget his shoulder, huh? Let me take a look. Oh, bleeding a little. You better get him back to our car here and take it easy until we can get you the medical treatment. Yeah, be with you in a minute. All right, old man, come on. Yeah, that's it. Easy now. There. Now you sit tight, and I'll be right back. You drive your car, Ben. Jack and I'll take this one and the girl. All right. In the looks of things, we'd better hurry or she'll need a coroner instead of a doctor. Arriving at Santa Monica, the two cars pull up to a stop in front of Martin's Hospital, where the girl is discovered to have died en route. Without informing the wounded husband of his wife's death, the attendants rush into the operating room and remove a 25 caliber slug from his left arm. A short while later in the small hospital room, Deputy Sheriff Walter Hunter questioned the young man. You're a pretty lucky young fellow. I slugged missed your lung by a fraction of an inch. Yeah, I'm lucky. Huh? Lucille gets shot and I get shot and you say I'm lucky. I'd like to ask you some questions if you feel up to it. Oh, go ahead. Anything to help find those dirty rats. What's your full name? John D. Bolton. And your wife? Lucille Smith Bolton. Suppose you tell me all you can about what happened this morning. Well... Last night, I decided it'd be nice to take a drive along the ocean. The seal seemed to like the idea, so we started out and drove up the coast a ways, and, and we turned around and started back. That was early this morning? Yeah. Well, anyway, we came back by way of Roosevelt Highway, and after we'd been driving a while, we noticed the Christ La Rosa right behind us. What was it doing? Well, it wasn't exactly doing anything, but it passed us once and then let us pass it, and it made us both kind of nervous. Now, what happened next? Well, we were still just driving along, and all of a sudden, this Chrysler comes up alongside and heads us off to the side. I told Lucille to sit tight that it was probably a holdup. What did the other car do? Well, it pulled up right in front of my car, and two men got out. Did you see them well? Sure, the lights of my car were right on them. Well, there were, there were two of them. One, a tall, slim fellow, and the other, a short kind of a chunky guy. This was a Mexican. Well, the tall one came over to the side I was sitting on and said it was the right side. Well, who was driving your car? It was my wife. We changed back to Rosa. Oh, I see. All right. Go ahead with the story. Well, this tall guy asked me for my money, and I got out my wallet and gave it to him. He took the money in it, 26 bucks, and then he threw the wallet back in my lap. I told him I had some small change in my pocket, and he said he didn't want it, so I just... And uh, what happened then? Oh, well, that's where the trouble started. Just as I was about to leave, my wife said to the tall guy, Isn't your name Wood? And at that, the Mexican said, You better get them. Plug them. And the tall fellow pulled the trigger on his gun and shot Lucille. What did you do? Oh, I don't know exactly. I was just scared that I think I asked him, please, not to shoot me more. And then this tall guy reached in and shot Lucille again. I tried to grab his arm. He let me have it in the shoulder. He had to lean all the way across you to shoot the last shot at your wife, didn't he? Yes. Couldn't you have grabbed the gun and kept him from doing it? Oh, I suppose so. But I tell you, I was so frightened I didn't know what it was doing. And when I did try to get his arm, he shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. What did they get his arm? He shot me. 
What did they get his army shot me? 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 What did they do after that? Oh, they ran and jumped in their car. Do after that. Oh, they ran and jumped in their car. Do after that. Oh, they ran and jumped in their car. Do after that. Oh, they ran and jumped in their car. Do after that. Oh, they ran and jumped in their car. Do after that. Oh, they ran and jumped in their car. Do after that. Oh, they ran and jumped in their car. Do after that. Oh, they ran and jumped in their car. Do after that. Oh, they ran and jumped in their car and started off towards Ventura. What did you do after they left? I pushed Lucille over to the right side of the seat and got in the driver's seat and started towards Santa Monica. You were able to drive all right? Well, yeah, I heard a lot to steer, and I had a hard time getting the car started, but I managed to keep it on the road. Three or four cars passed me, and I yelled at each one and tried to attract their attention by bringing them my life, but oh, when they heard me yelling, they just drove by. I was afraid it was a stick-up. Well, anyway, finally I stopped, and well, you know the rest. Haven't I seen you before somewhere? Well, I don't know. You, you might have, I suppose. Tell me. Do you carry a gun? No. Have you a license to carry? No. That's funny. I'd swear that I'd seen you up at the sheriff's office trying to get a permit to carry a gun. Well, you haven't. I've never had a gun. Go in and ask Lucille. She knows I haven't got a gun. She knows who this fellow Woods is, too. She can tell you all about it. Do you know anyone by that name? No, but Lucille might have met him at the dance hall. She teaches dancing. Now, one more thing, Mr. Bolton. If this man who shot your wife lean way into the car, there might be fingerprints somewhere, mightn't there? Yeah, he is on the door of the car, I guess. He, he had his left hand on it. Now that's fine. It might be of great assistance in finding out who the man is. No, 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 wait a minute. Come to think of it, he wore chamois gloves. No, there wouldn't be any prints. He wore gloves. You're certain of that? Sure, I'm certain. Why don't you ask Lucille in the next room there? She'd probably tell you who the guy is. He's probably some tramp friend of hers. Bolton, who does not yet know his wife is dead, Deputy Hunter returns to the Santa Monica Police Station where he finds Captain Bright, head of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Homicide Detail, waiting for his report. Together, the men drive to the morgue where they inspect the body of the deceased Lucille Bolton. They discover that two bullets have penetrated her head, one on the level with her right ear and one about an inch below it. The index finger of her right hand is powder burnt, indicating that one of the bullets was fired at close range. Returning to the garage, Bright and Hunter begin a thorough search for the murder car. According to Bolton, he was sitting over here on the right side, and his wife was driving. That would mean that whoever shot her the second time would have to lean all the way across Bolton to do it. The powder burns we found on her finger, though, that that last shot was fired from the gun directly against her head. That's what it looks like to me. Funny that Bolton didn't do something about it. Because he was too scared to move. I'm not so sure of that, Hunter. I want to take a look at this seat. Let's see. He was sitting there, and the shot went into his left shoulder. That's right. And she was sitting over there, under the wheel. Say, Hunter, take a look at these blood stains on the seat here. Yeah, what about them? You notice that there's only a few little drops over on the driver's side, and here, where he was supposed to be sitting... In a regular pool. Yeah. It strikes me that there should, by all rights, be a lot more blood on her side than where he was sitting. Hey, that's right. And here's something more. You see where this stain is on this side? Now, if Bolton was sitting on the right side here and he was shot in his left shoulder, the stain should be on his left side on the seat. Check? Check. But if you'll notice, you'll see that they are right here on the edge and running down the side of the door. And the stains on the driver's side are closer to the door, too. Now, supposing we reverse the position. Bolton driving, his wife sitting on the right side here. Now, someone pumps a couple of slugs into her head. The first one, she throws her hand up to her face, her right hand. The second shot is right through the index finger and into her head. The only place for any blood to go is down the right side and onto the seat and door. Am I right so far? It certainly looks like it. All right, Bolton. Over on that side, 
Gets the slug in his left shoulder. And where does the blood go? Down the left side of the seat and onto the running board. Which leaves us with only one conclusion. This is murder, all right. But not for robbery. John Bolton murdered his own wife. As a result of Captain Bright's discovery, Bolton is taken to the Los Angeles County Jail and lodged in Hospital Ward 110. Meanwhile, Captain Bright, in company with Hunter and three other deputies, drive out to the supposed scene of the shooting. Look for any clues that might be there. To return to Los Angeles empty-handed. Upon the return, Bright assigns deputies Hunter and Zahar the task of searching Bolton's apartment, instructing them to pick up every article of clothing, all letters, everything that might prove to be important. What kind of a bullet they take out of Bolton's arm? Twenty-five caliber slug. Huh? Well, here's another one in the sink. And then Bolton told me he'd never own a gun. Uh-oh. Here's just the box I'm looking for. I'll bet a dollar to a dime this key I've got will open this tin box. Here, let me try it. Hey, you're right. Mm. Let's see now. Here's a couple of pawn tickets, some cash. That looks like a couple of insurance policies. Yeah, let's see it. I made out to Lucy Smith Bolton, one for 5000 and one for 10000 That's quite a bit of insurance for a guy to carry on his wife. You said it. I think we'd better take this stuff into Captain Bright and see what he says about it. I have a feeling that this insurance is going to throw a lot of light on this thing. It might even be a little thing like the motive. <laughs> I saw the bulge of it in his pocket. And one time he put his hand in his pocket when he was threatening me. He threatened you as well as your daughter? He certainly did. He said he was going to shoot both of us. Yeah, you certain of those words? Absolutely. How could I ever forget them? It isn't pleasant to have someone stand in front of you and tell you he's going to kill you sometime. Well, of course not. I can assure you it isn't. My main object in these questions is to ascertain that John Bolton actually had a gun and threatened to use it. Well, I can swear to that, Captain. I'm certain that he shot my daughter. And I want you to see that he pays for it. No, don't worry about that. I have no doubt at all that he'll pay for it, and pay for it with his neck. <laughs> of numerous witnesses brings always the same answer. Bolton has been seen with a gun, one that fits the description of a murder gun, but Bolton himself refuses to change his story of the shooting. Calmly, he faces the seated barrages of questions. Always, he says the same thing, that if Lucille were alive, she would verify his statement. From an intimate of his, they learn... I figured he bumped her off. He was always talking about what a heel she was and how he was going to get rid of her pretty soon. When did you last see Bolton? Wednesday night. Well, that would be the night of the shooting? Yeah, that's right. Did he say anything unusual that night? Well, he asked me a couple of times if I'd like to make a hundred bucks. What did you say to that? Naturally, I told him it'd be okay with me if it was on the level. Yeah. Did he outline anything that you would have do for the money? Yeah. He said maybe he could give me some dough if I'd just drive a car down to the beach room and leave it for a while and then go back and bring it back to town. What did he want you to do that for? I don't know. I figured he was in the liquor racket, though, and that he probably wanted me to take the dirty work. Did you say you'll do it? Not exactly. I never got around to that. But uh, once in the evening, he ups and says to me, what would you do for $10,000? I told him I thought he was nuts and asked him what he meant, but he wouldn't say no more. Did he always drive his own car? No, he had a guy chauffeuring for him. You know his name? No, but I think it was Eddie something. I figured it might be Eddie Woods when I read about it in the paper. Do you know an Eddie Woods? No, like I told you. I just sort of figured that this guy driving for Johnny might be the fellow he was trying to pin the shooting on. John's just kind of a guy. All right, I think that's all. 
Keep in touch with me. I'll let you know if I want anything more from you. Okay, Cap. And I hope you hang the lousy bum. Bolton, you told us the other day that you didn't know anyone by the name of Wood. Is that right? Sure, that's right. But as a matter of fact, the man you had driving for you is named Woods, isn't he? He is not. What is his name? Johnson. Ed Johnson. You're absolutely sure that his name isn't Wood? Eddie Wood? Of course I'm sure. You know, Bolton, things are going to be plenty tough for you if you don't tell us the truth. You don't have to make it, tell us. But when you get in court and face some of the people who are going to testify against you... It's going to be hard for you to think up the right answer. Now, I suppose you have plenty of people who'd like to see me go up for this, but they can't prove anything. We can prove that you owned a gun and showed it to several people at different times. Oh, I had a gun for a while. You told me different the last time I had it. Well, it was an old six-shooter. It wasn't a good gun. You never owned a twenty-five automatic? No. You ever fired one? Well, I suppose I have fired one. What do you mean, you suppose you'll find one? Well, just that. I don't remember. Did you ever have occasion to have a twenty-five caliber bullet in your possession? No. You never fired a twenty-five bullet and saved the slug? No, didn't I just tell you that I didn't have an automatic? You told me that you never had a gun a little while ago. Do you know what an automatic of this type looks like? What type? Well, the kind that kills your wife. I don't know what kind kills this here. Could you... See it when the man leaned across you to shoot her? No, I couldn't see it. Bolton, I'm going to tell you a few of the things that we know about you that you don't think we do. In the first place, you threatened to kill your wife several times. I did not. Well, I'll just leave. a minute, Bolton. I'll do the talking for a minute. You just listen. All right. Go ahead. We also know that you were in possession of an automatic that colors with a type of gun that killed your wife and wounded you. Thirdly, we have a man who will tell the court how you offered him $100 to drive your car down to the beach and leave it for a while, and then bring it back to town. Yeah, who's that? Never mind who it is. He's all set to testify if we need him. Yeah, I don't see how that proves anything anyway. That's all right with us, Bolton. We also know that you asked this same man what he'd do for $10,000. What do you mean by that? I don't remember ever having said that. You had your wife insured for about that much, didn't you? About that, yes. Yet you didn't drive her out to the beach that night and shoot her first, then yourself, so to be able to collect this insurance and also get rid of her? No, I did not. You didn't figure that by telling us about a man named Wood, we might get the wrong person for the crime? No. Where'd you get the car you were driving that night? From a friend of mine. Did you rent it? No, a friend of mine asked me to drive it. I wanted to sell it to him. But you were in the habit of renting cars, weren't you? Well, yes, I suppose so. In fact, you rented a different one almost every night. Yes. What was your idea in doing that? I was trying to impress people that I had lots of doors. If you haven't? Oh, I've got enough. Enough for what? Enough to live on without having to worry too much. Enough to live on without the money from your wife's insurance? Yes, of course. And you still insist that you were held up and that your wife was shot by the man who robbed Yes, because that's the truth. All right, sir. I guess there's no use in asking anything more. All I can say is this. It's going to be plenty tough scrap when you get into court. All right. Take you back to the cell, Sergeant. John Bolton, suspect, denies his guilt and stands his ground, stubbornly refusing to change his story, steadfastly claiming that his friends are framing him. Finally, on December 19th, just 40 days after the shooting of Lucille Bolton, John Bolton goes on trial. This witness has a direct bearing on this case, counsel. He has, Your Honor. Very well, you may call him. Mr. Gilberta, can you step over here, please? Please, sure. You found this word, testimony you're about to give in this court suit, the whole truth, but even the truth will be God. Sure, I do. Mr. Gilberta, I'm going to ask you a few questions. I want you to think very carefully before you answer them. You are aware, are you not, that the life of a fellow man may rest upon what you say here this afternoon? Yes, sir. All right. Now, you know a man by the name of John Bolton? 
sure, I know. And how long did you know him? Well, I know him about the uh, about six to ten months. I see. You knew his wife, Lucille, too. Oh, you? yes, but I did, sure. Now, Mr. Gavertis, did you ever see this John Bolton with a gun? With a gun? Sure. Suppose you tell the court just what the circumstances were at that time. You mean I should tell everything, huh? Yes, everything that happened at the time when you saw the gun. Yes. Well, uh, well, it's Johnny and me. Just a it? moment, Mr. Gavertis. Yeah. By Johnny, I presume you mean John Bolton? That's the right, Johnny Bolton. Yes. Right. Go right ahead with your story. Well, uh, not so long ago, you see, it's Johnny and Lucille. Uh, that is the lady, what is she's a dead and I judge. Well, the way he go to a dance in the Linwood. On the way out in the car, Johnny, he was a calling her every kind of a name, you know. He was telling her she was a bomb and a tramp and everything like that. You see. And they fight all the way out. And when we get to this place, he went in, and I danced with Lucille. And while we were dancing, she told me she was afraid of Johnny. That he had told her he was going to fix her. Just a moment. Did she say fix her? I mean by that were those the exact words. Well, I think she says she say he was going to shoot her. Johnny told me, or told his wife, uh, he was going to shoot her. I see. Now, is that all that happened at the dam? No, sir. There was a big fight, too. A fight? Well, tell us about that. Well, you see, it was like this. You see, that Johnny, he was dancing with some girl, and the big red-headed fellow, he asked to see the dance with him, too. So she did. Well, Johnny, he used to get the match. And while he see them dancing together, he stopped, and he walked over, and he punched this red-headed guy right in the face. Mm, just like that. Sure. So Mr. Liabra got to pain, just like that. See? Well, he started fighting everyone in any place, all over the place, and all of a sudden, Johnny, he's pull out the gun from his pocket, and look, was always going to shoot to start everybody. Oh, see? And, and what did you do then? Well, now the fellow and me, we grabbed him, and we threw him down on the floor, and I grabbed the gun. Then we dragged Johnny out of the outside, and we put him in the car, and we take him home. You say you took the gun from him. Uh, what did you do with it? Well, I, uh, well, I keep it for a day, and then uh, Johnny asked me for it, so I give it the back to him, you see. But I took the bullets out of it and I kept them. Now, what kind of a gun was it, Mr. Gavirda? Well, it was a uh, uh, kind of a, it was a, a, a baby horse, a coat, you know. Coat, oh, yes. Coat, yeah. yeah. You're, you're sure of that? Yes, a coat, yes. A uh, 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 25 automatic coat. Uh, thank you. Mr. Gavirda, there's one more thing I want to ask you relating to the conversation you had with Lucille. Did you ever hear Bolton say anything about killing her? Sure I did. He said he couldn't sleep at the night. And that if he didn't do something about the Lucille pretty soon, he was going to go crazy. I told him he shouldn't keep a gun around because he was allowed to lose his head sometimes. And he told me to mind my own business. And if he wanted to shoot her, it was up to him. And for me to keep my mouth shut. I see. Now you say he kept his gun around the house. Sure, all of the time. He keep it in his pocket. When he changed his pants, he changed the gun from one pair of pants to another. Mm-hmm. That was the same gun that you took away from him on the evening of the fight? Yes, sir. A Colt 25 automatic. Thank you, Mr. Gavirda. I think that's all. Cross examine. Mr. Gavirda, are you an expert of firearms? Me? No, sir, I am not. Yet you can positively identify this gun here as the same type which you saw John Bolton carry? Sure, certainly I Now, doesn't it strike you that that's an awfully definite accusation you're making? I was asked if I could say what the kind of a gun it was, and I did. What's the matter, huh? Oh, very well, Mr. Roberta. You may go. Thank you, Judge. Your Honor, my brief is complete. I have no further witnesses to call. Is the defense counsel anything more before counsel for the state begins his summary of the jury? We rest our case, Your Honor. <laughs> John Bolton, the jury has seen fit to find you guilty of murder in the second degree. I cannot sentence you to die for your crime, but I can give you to you the maximum sentence prescribed by law, and that I will give you. I sentence you to spend the rest of your natural life in San Quentin Penitentiary. <laughs> Even the homicide detail of the sheriff's office 
whether to was someone who thought he or she could break the law and get away with it. John Dalton was convinced that it was a perfect crime. It would never be suspected. As you see by tonight's story, that only was suspected, but he received life in prison for his trouble. This department, our methods of building a suspect, are now the fiction story type. We do not use third degree, threatening or promising. They've been proven over a long period of time, they give given enough rope, a guilty man will hang himself. That is exactly what we do. Let the man talk as long as he wants to, and then, by repeating, ask him the same question, break his story. If the suspect is lying, he soon finds the hundred or so questions he answers one day, today, are pretty hard to remember the next day. He's telling the truth. That fact is quickly apparent. Thank you, Dr. Joel. Ladies and gentlemen, every day you hear the shriek of police sirens. You see police cars and fire engines carrying past you at top speed to rescue someone from danger. To meet so many emergencies every day, to meet so many emergencies every day requires an unusual gasoline. Ordinary gasoline will sputter and balk and fail when you cramp the throttle to the floor. Out of all the gasolines on this market, Rio Grande Crack has been chosen to power more police cars and emergency engines than any other gasoline. When you drive into the Rio Grande service station to get your free copy of the Calling All Cars News and to select a free gift for your boy or girl, fill your tank with the same cracked gasoline police cars use so you can meet your own daily driving emergencies with police car performance. Calling all cars, attention all Los Angeles County Sheriff cars, cancellation broadcast 99. John Bolton found guilty of murdering his wife. He is now in San Quentin. That's all. Rolls and closes. <laughs> The United States Army and Navy have placed their motor oil contract with Sinclair for the same Sinclair motor oil your Rio Grande dealer sells in tamper-proof, oversized cans for only 25 cents a quart. <laughs> 